So today we're going to be discussing the Euler-Lagrange equation and its derivation. Um, this is important in classical mechanics and dynamics as a whole in describing the energy of a system. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to start out, we have some integral that is bounded between some arbitrary x's um, with some arbitrary function, which is a function of x. It's a function of y which is in turn a function of x and a function of the first derivative of y integrated over dx. Uh, for instance, I will make an arbitrary picture here. We have the y-axis, we have our x-axis, we have our starting point, that's going to be xa. We have our endpoint, oh, have our endpoint xb. This is what the function minimized looks like. Um, so we want to prove that this is the minimization of this function here. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that there exists some function y bar of x with some perturbation off of what we assume is going to be the minimized function, um, such that when the perturbation, uh, the small epsilon there is zero, that comes back down to the y that we're looking for. Uh, and I will update our integral. So now it is a function of that epsilon. Uh, here we are. Oh. So note here that x does not actually take on any, uh, any values from the perturbation. Uh, the perturbation only affects the y values here. Uh, so there we go. Um, so we need to lay down three assumptions with this. Uh, first is that at our value of Uh, y bar at a with some arbitrary epsilon is equal to y a. Likewise, y bar at x b, some arbitrary epsilon equals y b. And that, that, that's just essentially stating that these two endpoints are going to be constants. Uh, fair enough. That's how we're bounding it. And this will happen for all values of epsilon. Uh, next, I've said that this is another assumption that we make. Second assumption is that the y bar with no epsilon is the function we're looking for. And likewise, we assume that the first derivative exists and the second derivative also exists, essentially saying that this function smoothed out through the second derivative. And those are all of our assumptions that we're making here. So to extremize a function, what we need to do is we need to take the first derivative of the integral that we have here, the i value, and we want to evaluate for no perturbation, uh, which actually will then lead us with some mess of an integral that looks like this. Uh, so because we have two terms here that rely on epsilon, we can't just go blindly uh, say df over d epsilon, uh, because those x's will, or sorry, the, the, um, the y's rely on the epsilons there, whereas the x does not. So what we end up with here is some mess looking like that, df over dy times dy over d epsilon plus df over d y bar prime d y bar prime over d epsilon uh, dx. So this right there is a term that we can just set off to the side and that that that's good you know that that that's fine but we need to expand this out further. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use UV substitution 
uh, if you remember this from Calc 1 or Calc 2, I forget where they teach it. So you take, what we're going to say is we're going to say u is equal to df over dy hat, or dy bar prime. dv is just going to be the derivative of y bar prime with respect to epsilon. And what we can do is then we can go find du, which is simply just going to be d dx, if I recall correctly, d dx, uh, df, dy prime, dx. And likewise, v, we take the integration of that. Uh, with respect to x here, and what we end up with is dy bar with respect to d epsilon. So uh, I, I do want to clarify here the, the primes represent differentiation with respect to x. Um, that, that, is a, that is an important clarification that we need to make. Um, so if you see the prime there, assume that we are differ differentiating with respect to x. Um, so what that leaves us with is we now have an integral that looks like this. So we take down our df dy bar times dy bar d epsilon plus, oh, and then we're going to put a dx there. We're going to close off the integral, right, because we can split that down because of linearity of the operator. Um, so then we're going to take this and we're going to look at our df over dy bar prime, dy bar prime, oh, apologies, uh, that should not be primed, d epsilon, again, remember this is, this is just u, v, um, and then we have to subtract, right? the integral of v du. Um, we're going to keep our bounds. I almost forgot my bounds over here. So now we have our bounds over there. So now we can plug in. We end up with dy bar differentiated with respect to epsilon uh, times d over dx df dy prime dx so if if you know what the the end result looks like you can already you can already see one uh oh, backwards there you can already see where this is going um let me just clean that up a little bit you can already see where this is going um we do have a glaring issue right here, right? We have this term here. But so what we can do is we can plug in at our values and evaluate this at xb and xa, right? But one of the core assumptions that we made at the start of this is that at any given at, at any given value of epsilon at those bounds, we have a constant. So right, you take a derivative of a constant, that just drops out. So what we can do is we can then lump together the remaining terms inside our integrals here. So what we do end up with is dy, d epsilon, quantity, df, dy minus d dx, df, dy bar prime. And so the thing about this now, what we can do here is we want this to equal zero, right? Because that's what happens at the extreme. This should all be zero and that'll, that'll show that we have an extreme. Um, so in between xa and xb, this is just some arbitrary function. We don't know what it is. All we know is that this has to be zero at the bounds, but in between, it can be whatever. So we can't reliably assume that this will be zero. 
However, if we want this to be zero, we can state and force this set df dy minus d dx df d bar prime dy bar prime equal to zero. And all you have to do there is substitute in f. for the Lagrangian.